This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is my joy to welcome you to Green Memorial United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Joanna, the pastor here. We're so glad that you're here with us, whether you're with us online or here with us in the sanctuary. We are glad to be worshiping together on the second Sunday of Easter. Glad to be together in the joy of the Lord. There's much that's happening in our midst, and so there's a couple of things I want to share with you. Again, we hope you're getting our emails. The best way to sign up for those are on our website at gmumc.org. This week, we will do, have wine and dine together. It should be a great gathering Thursday evening. You, the last day to sign up, if you're hoping to be with us, is online today. You can find that link under events on our website. We're excited about that work and excited about our ways to celebrate and uplift the ministry of Family Promise, a group that we've been working together for many years and thrilled to be able to support them. We also, if we're hosting the Survivor Brunch here at church this next coming weekend, Saturday the 13th from 10 to noon, uh, for, as part of the American Cancer Society. And if you are a survivor, we would please love for you to join us and be part of that event uh, and, and that great partnership that we've been part, with, part of as well. So you can let Debbie know if you are able to come to the Survivor Brunch next Saturday the 13th. We also uh, are going to be part of Pride in the Park. We're going to be down at Elmwood Park at uh, the end of this month on the 28th, uh, part of that festival space and hosting a kids' space, a space for families to come and play. So if you are able to be part of the setup there or cleanup of that event, if you could let me know, that would be great. We're excited to be part of that good and uh, beautiful work in the community. Uh, this Sunday, the second Sunday of Easter, is historically been called Holy Humor Sunday. I'm not going to do my Jerry Seinfeld impression, nor am I going to work my stand-up for you today. Uh, but the point of Holy Humor Sunday is a thought that we celebrate on this Sunday. Uh, if, if we are people who say, where, O oh, death, is your victory?
love for everyone. So if there's a little cuddling out here in the, in the, uh, during the service, that's just fine because we all need to stay warm. We're all God's children. But you know, this whole week has been interesting, hasn't it? Somewhere they had big storms. There was a tornado. There was an earthquake. All these things have been going on. That's all part of God's plan for us. I'm not going to use this. <laughs> but it's kind of God's plan, and that's just the way life goes. You know, some days we have good days, some days we have bad days, but all through that whole time, what is that one thing we always have with us? God. That's right. God is always with us. It doesn't matter if we're rolling in dirt, if we're sitting in church, if you're singing in the choir, he is always with us through your bad days, through the good days, through the wind and the rain. And we've got to remember that all of this is a purpose. And God made the earth and made it good, and we have to be thankful for all of that. Just like you have to be thankful for the people that are out here in the congregation, your moms and dads, your friends, for our choir, for our pastor. Thankful for everyone all the time that's the most gracious blessing that god could give us right so god is good god is good all the time all the time all the time, all the time. god is good, god is good. Amen. amen Good morning. A reading today is Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to them, you shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets the word of God for the people of God.
as we move through the season, we'll be looking at different stories of the early church in the book of Acts. And today we start in Acts 4, verses 32 through 35. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, speak your words of life for us and guide us to your will. Holy Spirit, convict us to be the people you call us to be. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation sin of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, the total eclipse that's happening tomorrow is one of those things that we're left with some wonder, joy, and excitement about. You know, it can only happen during a new moon cycle. It is a rare thing uh, to happen because of the axis that we rotate on in the five degree tilt and will only last a little bit of time. The longest time of the totality will be uh, in a small town in Mexico, but even in places in Ohio that are in the path of totality, I know it'll only be about three minutes of sort of the, to the, to the totality experience. But this event where darkness comes in the day and we see the solar rays, though do not look at it if you don't have the glasses. I feel like you have to say that when you talk about the eclipse these days. Uh, it's generating a lot of hype. Maybe as it should, right? Maybe the power of light shouldn't be taken for granted, right? This chance to see darkness and stars in the day is not to be lost on us. You know, people are flocking, right? They're, Airbnb has like figured out the business in the path of totality, supposedly, right? People are flocking to see this gift of the creator, really, right? A way to see the majesty of God for sure. But I also wonder, I was struck this week as I thought about it and the news coverage of it and all that, and I thought about how we're still in this season of Easter, that this natural gift could be a way to also reflect on the most powerful gift, the resurrection, and a sharp reminder that fellowship helps us to live in the light just like all these people flocking to see it all together. Easter falls in the church calendar life. It's not just one celebratory Sunday. Like if you happen to be out of town last week, you haven't really missed Easter. Easter tide lasts 50 days and goes all the way until the celebration of Pentecost. And in that season, the church has historically looked at the early church and the stories found in the book of Acts to retell that time in reflection. And so this season, we can ask, what did Easter mean for them, and what does it mean for us? And the passage we read today is both super straightforward and full of complexity. The straightforward is that the early church shared what they had. Period. Right? Easter meant that they could live in a radical communal, communal way, in like real and tangible ways like food, possessions, and land, they shared what they had. But verse 33 reminds us that it's possible because the power they had to live and testify in this way was powered by the resurrection. The resurrection makes it possible then for that command Jesus gave to love God with all of who you are, mind, body, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself to be radically powered. Hang with me a moment. And, and we could talk about it, like, that could be seen as the way, like, the Mario Kart golden mushroom that bumps you into super speed, if you will. That's how resurrection works. Or you could view resurrection power as this, like, spiritual steroid, right? Like, resurrection power pumps you up. There you go. There's your holy humor Sunday. No, just kidding. And in many ways, I want to be clear that is true, right? Like, I want to be clear that, yes, like, resurrection power could be described as like spiritual steroids. You know, like it takes the way of God being a way maker, a miracle mover, an all powerful and loving God and sends it sky high, a rocket fueled capacity of grace. 
beyond our ability to see it, we know resurrection power is at work. And I don't want to diminish that. But what if this loving God and loving neighbor resurrection power looks as real and nitty gritty as everyday life? Like what if we don't assume that it is sort of like golden mushroom, steroid, injected kind of thing? And what if we just assume that it's also done by wildly imperfect people in wildly ordinary ways? You know, there's a lot of Christians now that you might hear them say that they'll say like, man, if we were just like the church in Acts, it would fix all of our modern day church problems. The church in Acts, they had it all together. We would have it figured out too. And I mean, I, I want to start with the truth that these examples are of real people. And while real people are people. And now while here in chapter 4, we learn that they gave all they could with the intent that no one would be needy in their midst. And they did that, right? They, we believe that as an example. They shared what they had. But they didn't even actually nail that goal. Because we see in Acts 5, verses 1 through 2, Ananias and Sapphira sold their property, but kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part of that to the feet of the apostles. And then in the next chapter, Acts 6, 1 through 7, we learn that the widows, right, who would have been a wildly vulnerable and needy part of that community, were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. We don't make it two chapters before this falls apart. Let's be clear. So let's start with another complex part of this truth. Church has been, and I am afraid until Christ comes again, will always be a group of sinners doing imperfect work. We're all, they, you, me, us, are making a best effort kind of deal, but mistakes are a real part of it. Loving God and others, even fueled in the power of the resurrection, is still the messy and beautiful work of life. And so what does that mean for us now? We're reminded, as Samuel Valentine writes in Feasting on the Word, that the imperative of this mission however, is not only to proclaim the resurrection gospel, but also to embody its redemptive truth by caring for one another in ways that secure the fullness of life God intends. So what does Easter mean? It means we love God and we love neighbor in real and embodied ways. When we say we believe in the resurrection of the body, as we say affirmations of faith, it might mean something like this. Stanley Hauerwas, Duke Divinity professor and theologian, notes this when we talk about resurrection and the power of Easter, that it isn't this far-off thing promised someday that we can't know. But rather, he notes, our hope in life beyond death is a hope made possible, not by some general sentimental belief in life after death, but by our participation in the life of Christ. How do we know this resurrection power, and how are we fueled by it? in the imperfect work of loving and caring for each other in embodied ways. It's often why they say you can't find a Christian fully isolated and alone. Even the ancient mystics we called the desert fathers and mothers relied on a community and had people who were around them even as they lived largely alone in ascetic life. And I've wondered, as we thought of the Acts example, if there's a word in there for us as Christians now. Like, I'm not going to tell you that, okay, when we get up from the service, we all need to go call a realtor, sell all our land and homes and cars and all of that. Now, I might suggest to you that there's something to be said about rethinking our positions a bit. Things like buy nothing groups on Facebook and sharing economies could be a way to live into Easter. I still think one of the best examples of Christianity I've heard about is a family who gathered all the folks on their street and they put a shared shed of yard tools. Everybody had access to the yard tools on their street. They thought, we all, we all don't need to have to own one of all of these. And so they didn't then, they pooled what they had, they distributed the duplicates to those that had a need, and they gave away the money from whatever they, they sort of, they pooled their money resources, right? It was a simple shed of pruning shears and such, changing the world, right? It was one way a sharing economy could fix things. That easy and that powerful. But I've also wondered this week that Acts teaches us a much more radical stance than just giving away stuff to goodwill, which again is a good thing. But what if it is an open-heartedness open that we are called to? 
What if love of God really makes us more open? A sharing not just stuff, but ourselves. Stanley Hauerwas, again in a quote that I've seen shared across social media, writes, We shall have to break the habit of having church in such a way that people are deceived into thinking they can be Christians and remain strangers. Think of it. In a place where just last year the Surgeon General came out and said, there's a loneliness epidemic, is the phrase the Surgeon General used, of isolation. So this generation growing up is the, the most isolated, the least likely to spend time with their peers, calling it the underappreciated public health crisis. There was an advisory group that came out with a new national strategy around this loneliness epidemic. One of the six foundational pillars they write about is cultivating a culture of connection. Is that not, in fact, the gift of koinonia, as we use it in Greek, of Christian fellowship? Of radical communal shared living, of vulnerable sharing of ourselves that we see here? A gift that church can claim with radical power. That in fact it's a gift we've seen since the church in Acts. There's an article in the Atlantic that came out this week that in fact talks about this from an agnostic point of view. And I can't commend it to you enough and I'd love to chat with you about it. But I want you to think of children. How easily children meet on a playground, right? They share space, create friends with joy. Or how kids are so easy to give gifts to each other to those in their life. Now, let's be clear. Kids also have to be reminded to share easily, especially with siblings sometimes. But man, is this not resurrection power in our midst? Could we not learn from them to step into childlike faith to love God and love neighbor by choosing to acknowledge we can't be strangers and be Christians? Or as Hauerwas puts it in his memoir, Whatever it means to be a Christian, it at least involves the discovery of friends you did not know you had. Whatever it means to be a Christian, it at least involves the discovering of friends you did not know you had. What did Easter mean in Acts, and what does it mean now? It means by great power, by Easter's work, we discover a way we can share not just physical resources, but boldly share ourselves. It's exactly part of what happens at this table that we share in. There's some discussion of the theology of the table, where the mystery of communion, what is it that transforms in our midst in this sacrament? There's discussion, it's the bread that actually changes into the body of Christ, quite literally, transfiguration or not. And, and we don't have the time to unpack all of that. But I do want to talk that there are a lot of thoughts that communion, what is actually transformed, is not necessarily this, this bread in low form. But what is transformed and is made into the body of Christ is the power of the Holy Spirit in our midst that changes us. Like, what, what is transfigured in this midst? You and me in this moment. That almost the image is that this holy mystery is deed found in the breaking of the bread together, binding us together in love eternal, a way for us to know life after death, even here. The participation then in the life of Christ. It is true, indeed, that we often come to this table as strangers and are radically then sent from this table as friends. This is the grace of resurrection powered by the love of Christ and not us, that transforms us. Easter means we love God fully, mind, body, and soul. And that looks like Easter changing how we deeply and radically share who we are in loving others. This week, may you go then to connect. I mean, what would it look like if we each leave this table to make one connection? If we all left this worship looking for one way to deepen friendship? Would that not be Easter at work? God, who can redeem all things, will certainly be redeeming us. Go, friends. Go indeed in love and resurrection power to love, to love God and love each other. Glory to God, friend and Savior. Hallelujah. Amen.
Friends, we are reminded that we are invited to this table. All who love God, who earnestly repented their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. That's the invitation we make as we come to this table. Who love God, who repent of their sins, and who long to be connected to each other. That's the grace we find here. We trust that we can come as we are to this table, confessing who we are before God and one another. I'll invite you to turn to page 8 in your hymnal as we join in the prayer of confession found there. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Friends, as we come to give our offering, I want to remind you and invite you that part of the good work we do here is trying to make friends in our community. One way that we've begun doing this is through hot dogs and ice cream. I mean, come on. What better way to make a friend than sharing a hot dog? So we offer that. Uh, ne not this coming week, but the next week, we'll be offering that as a midday lunch on Wednesday to our downtown neighbors. The last time we did this, I think we gave away over 300 hot dogs. Uh, it's amazing to see who lines up. It's city employees, it's lawyers, it's people who have um, are unhoused. It is, it is all kinds of neighbors. We want you to put it on your calendar. If you can be with us to help us, that's awesome. If you can just be with us uh, to share in a hot dog with our friends downtown and come be part of that, you're welcome. There's ice cream too, you know? Like it's not, it's a good thing, making friends. So as we do that work together, it's possible because we're generous together. Because we share the resources God has given us, we believe in that communal radical act together. And so whether you've made those gifts online, whether you're going to place them in the baskets up front or you mail them in, we trust that God's at work in the midst of them, building up God's kingdom. So will you join me as we bless these gifts together? Generous God, as we gather to offer our tithes and offerings, we are reminded of the work of being a disciple to love God. Just as your word brings light into our lives, may our giving be an act of generosity, a reflection of the abundance of your grace and love. We thank you for the forgiveness and grace offered through your son, Jesus Christ. And as we give, may we also steward these gifts wisely for the betterment of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let no
defeated people of God. I'll remind you, if you want to sing that, uh, you can join uh, the Roosters, who do that every Tuesday for their lunch blessing at Wildwood. They sing it a cappella there, so we can sing it a cappella here. I'll invite you to turn to page 13 as we join in the great Thanksgiving, as we give thanks for this meal we share. May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from our captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, O God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that a time had come when you would save your people. Jesus, healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners, made friends with outcasts. And by the baptizing of his suffering, death, and resurrection, is how you gave birth to your church, a gathering of friends, delivered us from our slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And so we remember, on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, gathered with his friends, he took bread, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks again to you, O God, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, drink from this, all of you, for this is a cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. God, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us, the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ together, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, you make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast all together at his heavenly banquet table. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, together with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray as our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, in the breaking of the bread, are we not made into one body? In the sharing of the cup, do we not declare we serve one Lord? As you come forward for communion today, we invite you to come forward. You'll receive a piece of bread in your hand like you receive all grace. It is a gift. You'll dip it lightly in the cup to receive both elements at the same time. If you're in need of gluten-free elements, let us know. That's available for you with a dedicated cup. If you're worshiping with us from home, we'd love to share this table with you. Let us know, and we'll figure out a way to bring it to you. But all are invited to come share in this feast. I'll invite our servers to come forward as we share together.
Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, we give you thanks for this incredible mystery which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may rise from this table not as strangers but as friends sent to love you and your world. In the grace and power of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn in Christ alone.
of Easter. So may you go from this place in the resurrection power of God, in the presence of Jesus Christ, alive and at work in your life, and in the power of the Holy Spirit to love, to not meet a stranger, but meet a friend. May you go in peace this day and always. Amen. <laughs>